One pretty bizarre theory claims that space is water, and we're here to figure out whether it's a legit scientific idea or a fallacy resulting from myths and legends. Spoiler alert, you might be in for a surprise. Space is an almost perfect vacuum that has an extremely low density of hydrogen molecules, helium, dust particles, and plasma. As for water, it consists of hydrogen and oxygen. While hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, as well as the main material for the formation of stars, oxygen in space is mainly formed by the fusion of helium and carbon nuclei. It happens during the nuclear fusion process of stars that can be at different stages of their evolution. No wonder that there's much less oxygen than hydrogen in the universe, but it's still enough to form water in different states. For example, water molecules can be found on dust particles in molecular clouds, cold and dense regions of outer space. They are also present in interstellar space. There, they take the form of gas or ice on the surface of comets, asteroids, planets, and moons. The surface of some satellites of Saturn and Jupiter are covered with ice crust under which there's probably liquid water. Venus and Mars have gaseous and liquid water in their atmospheres. On our home planet, water covers more than 70% of its surface. In other words, space is filled with water, but it's distributed extremely unevenly. Interestingly, people started to compare space to water long before they found out what the cosmos was actually made of. The very theory that space is water dates back to the times before the current era. For example, some ancient civilizations believed that the ocean was a portal to space. Of course, in the physical sense, there's no direct connection between these two. But both represent a huge space with different mysterious inhabitants which people have been trying to study for a long, long time. People in the past believed that the ocean and stars were linked. Thousands of years have passed. People have mastered sea navigation, but we still haven't solved all the mysteries of the deep sea. Just like we don't know all that much about space, what giant monsters can be hiding in its depths? Only two to 5% of the world ocean has been explored and space has been explored by the same percentage. For example, dark matter, making up most of the universe, is still a mystery to us. Of course, in a physical sense, space doesn't behave like water. But both water and space are fatal. Without a special suit and equipment, you won't be able to breathe, and there's also decompression sickness threatening your life. Only in space, it's a lack of pressure, while in the depths of the ocean, it's either too much pressure or a dramatic pressure drop due to the fast rise from the depth to the surface. Even if outer space is not water, could it be liquid? One study suggested that the vacuum of outer space could be a dilatant fluid, also called shear thickening fluid. This theory is based on the so-called Pioneer Anomaly, a decades-old astrophysical mystery involving two NASA space probes. In the 1970s, two NASA spacecraft Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 started their journey toward Jupiter and Saturn. Observing their trajectory, scientists from NASA noticed that the probes started to slow down. Of course, the scientific community began to offer different hypotheses. One of them suggested that thermal radiation emitted by the probes in space could have created some pressure on their surface. It could be slowing down their movement. Eventually, after additional research, it was concluded that the physical vacuum most likely behaved like a dilatant fluid when the shear stress increased. Later, another scientist managed to find some proof that space-time can behave like a fluid. You see, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, space-time curves around mass and energy. That's what leads to an effect we know as gravity. But apparently, if you write down the equations of sound waves moving in liquid, they will look the same as the equations of waves traveling in a gravitational field. Such a mathematical relationship between fluids and gravity is called analog gravity. The researcher also managed to recreate these gravitational analogies in a lab. At the moment, the results of these experiments are still controversial, and many scientists don't support this theory. Even so, maybe the idea that outer space is liquid isn't so unfounded? So, the Terra planet's location seems to be at these coordinates.
Okay, let's go to outer space to see the situation. Is it me or is something moving? Oh no, there's too many piranhas. Oh my, there's too many of them. Oh no, 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 leave me alone! Wait, no! I have to get back to the ship! We need to find shelter, now! Just a little bit more! Huh, now we need to push off in the direction of the ship. It seems they don't see me. Come on, come on! Come on, almost! Oh no, this is the end. No, no, go away! Huh? Huh? So you guys aren't as bad as people say? About 71% of our beautiful planet is covered with water. That's why you see the coolest blue color when you look from space compared to all the other planets in our solar system. But we're still not sure how exactly we got all that water. And what makes us so special that we ended up the only ones with water on the surface and life? Some say the water has been here ever since our planet formed. Let's jump back to that chaotic period about 4.5 billion years ago when there were clouds of gas and dust swirling across our solar system. So, somehow, water molecules settled from all that chaos and just stayed there. Land mammals dominate our planet today, but we did originally come from water. So this was the main playground for creating life. Or maybe it wasn't quite like that. Some people believe that a long time ago, our planet didn't really have much water. That implies that all of our oceans formed from the water that came from outer space. Could it be that creatures from other planets sent it because they knew it was the key element for life to form and they needed friends? As far as we know, not quite. It's more like our water randomly came from asteroids and space dust. A Japanese robot brought tiny particles from one asteroid back to Earth, and scientists found something cool. They contained water. The water in these particles was probably created because, while coming from the sun, they were interacting with oxygen in space. And that way, we got water molecules. In the outer parts of the solar system where it's very cold, water forms icy objects, such as comets. As our planet moved around the sun, it collected these dust particles along with the water. Over time, this water fell from the skies and filled what we know today as the oceans. So maybe the water on Earth came from both these space dust particles and icy comets crashing into the surface. It's more probable than the theory that our planet had water even since the beginning because it was way too hot for water to become liquid. I mean, we have the best spot in the solar system for life because we're just the right distance from the sun for liquid water to exist. Any farther than that and it would be too cold and we would end up with ice only. Any closer to the sun would mean we'd have to deal with extremely high temperatures. We've already seen that happen to our neighbor Venus, the hottest planet in the solar system. But even though we had a great position, don't forget there was no atmosphere on Earth at its early stages, so nothing could keep that water in place. When our planet first formed, it was very hot and there was almost no air around it. The surface was like a melted rock. As it cooled down, an atmosphere started to form mostly from gases coming out of volcanoes. And it took about a half a billion years for the surface of Earth to cool enough to keep water. So at those early stages, it was probably simply evaporating. If water really came to Earth later, comets and asteroids might have brought it here. Both types of space travelers came to visit once in a while, and both had enough ice to deliver the same amount of water as what Earth's oceans contain. This seems plausible, right? 
but we still don't know if it was an asteroid or a comet, or whether it was just one or many of them. Also, when exactly did all that happen? One way to tell which one brought us this magnificent gift is to look at the chemical composition of space rocks and compare it to that of Earth. One study showed that water molecules on Earth are very similar to the molecules of rock samples received from ancient asteroid Vesta. Vesta is the second biggest object in the asteroid belt, which is located between Mars and Jupiter. Only Ceres is bigger, and this one falls into the category of dwarf planets anyway. It's the brightest asteroid you can sometimes see even with the unaided eye. But the fact that water molecules are quite similar on Vesta and on Earth doesn't necessarily mean that Vesta was the one that brought water to us. It could be some other similar object that came from space. There are studies that have backed up the theory that asteroids brought water, like the one conducted by the Rosetta spacecraft, the first one that orbited a comet. It was also the first space probe that sent a lander to a comet's surface. Thanks to that, scientists found out that water on comets was heavier than most of the water on Earth. But then again, in 2018, there was a new study involving another comet that contained water with a similar composition as the water on Earth. What makes it different from the previous one? Well, here we're talking about a hyperactive comet. Such comets release more water as they get closer to the Sun compared to regular comets. When one of those regular comets gets close to the Sun, its ice turns directly into a gas, and this gas can later become liquid water on the surface of a planet. But a hyperactive comet loses not only ice from its center, but also icy particles from its atmosphere. These icy particles may be the reason why hyperactive comets have water similar to Earth's. There is water in other places across our solar system too, even though it's different from the water on Earth. It's often hidden under the icy surface of moons, such as Europa and Enceladus. Europa is Jupiter's most famous moon since scientists believe there's a giant ocean hidden beneath its icy surface. This ocean supposedly has about twice as much water as all Earth's oceans combined. And where there's water, there might be life. And who knows what type of organisms we might find there one day when we finally take a trip across our solar system. Scientists discovered this ocean using a spacecraft called Galileo. Galileo orbited Jupiter and detected a magnetic field around Europa, which was a sign there might be a big, salty ocean. The surface of Europa is covered with smooth ice, but it's full of grooves and cracks with strange dark streaks and reddish features. Scientists believe the moon's surface is like that because warm ice rises from deep below. Also, Europa's icy shell squeezes and stretches because of Jupiter's insanely strong gravity. This creates heat inside the moon, which is probably enough to keep the ocean in its liquid form. Then, we have Ceres, the only dwarf planet we have in the inner solar system. It's small and difficult to study. But a few years ago, the Hubble telescope found out it was actually more of a watery world than a rocky ball like everyone previously thought. And the story remains the same. The mantle is icy, and then there's a mysterious slushy ocean underneath. Mars also has its own secret stashes of minerals that only form in water. And just like us, the red planet probably got its water from comets and asteroids that smashed into its surface. And it most likely had a lot of water on its surface, rivers, oceans, and lakes, but billions of years ago. That means Mars may have been a good spot to house life a really long time ago. But over time, the Sun ruthlessly pulled away the red planet's protective atmosphere with the help of its rather unpleasant charged particles called solar wind. As a result, liquid water on the Martian surface either evaporated and mixed with minerals or went underground and turned into ice. And this leftover water is especially interesting because it can tell us if there's still life on Mars. Plus, if we ever move to the red planet, it would be good to have reservoirs of liquid there. Picture yourself floating through space during a casual spacewalk when suddenly your trusty helmet decides to take a vacation. Instead of freaking out and gasping for your last breath, you take in a lungful of fresh cosmic air. Now, 
let's dive into the mind-boggling consequences of a breathable outer space. On our cozy planet Earth, the air we breathe consists mostly of nitrogen and oxygen, with a smattering of other gases to keep things interesting. But beyond our atmosphere's 6,214 mile reach, molecular oxygen becomes as rare as a unicorn in a tuxedo. With an expanded atmosphere enveloping space, you'd be strapping on your space boots and jetting off to any corner of the universe, all the while breathing as easy as you do back home. Prepare your eardrums for a symphony of cosmic proportions. In the vacuum of space, sound waves can't travel because there's a serious lack of molecules to carry those groovy vibrations. Yet, in our newfound space atmosphere, the sound would have a field day, traveling far and wide. Get ready to tune into the sun and the other celestial crooners. The sun, in all its glory, would be rocking out with constant vibrations that would make your head spin. It would sound like attending a never-ending concert, where the sun's tunes hit your ears at a staggering 125 decibels, which is louder than a thousand police sirens. In the absence of friction, planets and moons gracefully orbit the sun without losing speed. However, with the introduction of all that breathable air, things would take a wild turn. Planets and moons would be zooming through the atmosphere at super high speeds, resulting in some serious collisions with those pesky air particles. Brace yourself because Earth would suffer the same fiery fate as those ill-fated asteroids entering our planet's atmosphere. Scorched surfaces all around. That's definitely not the kind of barbecue we were hoping for. And if that wasn't enough chaos for one day, get ready for the grand finale. Eventually, the moon would halt its celestial dance and come to a standstill, only to be pulled closer by Earth's gravitational force. This cosmic tango would lead to a catastrophic collision that could potentially kiss our beloved planet goodbye. Not to mention the rest of the solar system wouldn't be throwing a victory party either. All that air would wreak havoc, turning our peaceful solar system into a menacing black hole. The air would bring about a hefty mass, roughly 5 billion times greater than the sun itself, spanning a mind-boggling radius of 90 astronomical units. If the sun's gravitational pull decided to play tug-of-war with this colossal mass, the solar system would start to feel the squeeze. Compression madness. In the end, we might witness the birth of a black hole. A monstrous entity 1,200 times more massive than the supermassive black hole sitting in the heart of the Milky Way. By this point, you and I would have to bid farewell to the mortal realm long ago, and it's probably for the best. The showdown between these two gravitational behemoths would be the stuff of legends. But alas, that's a tale for another day. In our hypothetical situation, there's more than one option. When we introduce matter or atmosphere into the equation, the delicate balance between Earth's surface temperature and its surroundings gets a good shakeup. We have some air to breathe right here on good old planet Earth, thanks to our trusty atmosphere. However, due to the greenhouse effect, this air of ours actually warms things up a bit compared to a hypothetical scenario without an atmosphere. On average, that is. You see, planets without an atmosphere might have lower average temperatures, but their temperature roller coaster is wilder, resulting in higher maximum temperatures. Okay, let's step away from our cozy Earth for a moment and ponder. What would happen if the entire solar system was filled with air? We'll temporarily ignore the small detail that Earth's movement would slow down, and we'd end up having a toasty rendezvous with the sun. It's a hypothetical situation after all. Now, predicting the outcome of such a scenario is like trying to decipher a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. On the other hand, you might think that air could reduce heat transfer by blocking light, leading to lower temperatures. It could increase heat transfer due to its insulating properties, which aren't as effective as a vacuum. This has nothing to do with the light energy transfer, but instead revolves around energy transfer through convection. Now, imagine a thick atmosphere sprawling throughout the entire solar system. It's like a cosmic security blanket, insulating the outward heat energy transfer from the sun and potentially lowering temperatures on Earth. Here's another nugget of cosmic trivia. 
Stars boast a convective zone on the outside and a radiative zone on the inside. It means that conduction, or rather advection, is just as important as radiation. So introducing an extra layer of air might improve this conduction gain. Yet the workings of extending the atmosphere and introducing gas into the solar system remain a cosmic enigma. Some stars out there rock an extended atmosphere. This atmosphere tends to be chilly due to dust gobbling up stars' radiation. It's like a condensation party zone where molecules can hang out and have a blast. But these stars also have some size to them, reaching as far as Earth's orbit. And at Earth's orbit, things would get steamy. Next up on this wild cosmic roller coaster, the moon decides to take a leisure break and comes to a complete stop. Oh boy, that's when things really go off the rails. Earth's gravity pulls the moon closer and closer, leading to an epic collision of cosmic proportions. Buckle up, my friend, because surviving scorching heat would only be the beginning of the end for our poor planet. It would be ripped apart, and the rest of the solar system would also go through some tough times, especially with all that air in the mix. In fact, brace yourself for a mind-blowing twist. Our once harmonious solar system could morph into a cosmic black hole. Why, you ask? Well, it's all because of the massive amount of air we'd have floating around. This air has wake, my friend, and with the heliosphere stretching a whopping 90 astronomical units, we're talking about a whole lot of mass, roughly 5 billion times more than the mighty sun itself. Now, if the sun's gravitational pull decided to gather all that mass and compress it, the solar system would become denser than a crowded interstellar party. Imagine squeezing all that air into a space about 80% of Earth's diameter. Dude, you'd witness the birth of a black hole right in front of your eyes. But let's be real here. Surviving that mind-boggling scenario is about as likely as finding a unicorn riding a flying saucer. So, fasten your seatbelt and enjoy the cosmic spectacle from the comfort of your imagination. For this journey through the bizarre reaches of the universe is nothing short of an electrifying adventure. In the end, we're left with more questions than answers. The intricate dance between air, heat, and the vastness of space remains an elusive puzzle. It's a game where the rules are yet to be discovered. So, let your imagination run wild and keep on pondering the wonders of the cosmos. If I were an astronaut and discovered that we could breathe in space, I would work with my crewmates and mission control to establish protocols and safety measures for operating in this newfound environment. Although breathable air would eliminate the need for spacesuits, other potential hazards might still exist, such as temperature extremes or radiation, which would require appropriate precautions. Then I would examine if the air was abundant and sustainable. Plus, I would explore ways to utilize it for various purposes, such as oxygen generation, atmosphere regulation in spacecraft, or even potential fuel production for long duration missions. And what would you do in such a situation? Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? 
because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data, and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more. But getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria, but hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. 
Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. Astronomers have been asking one question for decades. Is space really as black as we think it is? Well, NASA's New Horizons space mission might have just given us the answer. After exploring Pluto, the spacecraft kept going and is now billions of miles away from Earth. This means it's far from all the light pollution we get from sources like the sun and dust particles around our planet. Scientists used the spacecraft's simple camera to take images of what looked like incredibly boring blank space free of bright stars or anything else that could scatter light back into the camera. They then processed these images to remove all known sources of visible light. Once they'd removed the light from stars, plus scattered light from the Milky Way, they were left with light coming in from beyond our own galaxy. But here's the surprising part. They found that there was still plenty of unexplained light. In fact, it was about equal to all the light coming in from the known galaxies. That means there's just as much light outside of galaxies as inside them. So, where does all this light come from? Well, it could be coming from sources we haven't yet discovered, like small faint dwarf galaxies or unknown phenomena out in the universe. Or it could be associated with dark matter, which is still a mystery to scientists. With this groundbreaking research, we can say that space isn't as dark as we know it. What if we take all the light from the stars and galaxies out there and throw in some gas and dust clouds? What color do we get? Beige. This leads us to another question. Do we still need the sun if our space is colorful? And the short answer is, yes we do. Yeah. The colors of space are a result of the interactions of light with different celestial objects, such as stars, galaxies, and gas clouds. While these colors are fascinating to observe, they do not provide the energy life on Earth needs to survive. There you go. Don't expect to see the color of the sky in space. In space, no one can hear you scream. Or is that, in space, no one can hear ice cream? Well, either way, we know that no supernovas, crashing asteroids, and burning planets make a sound in space. Or do they? What if you actually can hear something out there? 
Well, let's see. Okie dokie, back to middle school. Ahem. Sound is a mechanical way of originating from vibration. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, the simplest example is guitar strings. Let's pluck one of them. It starts to vibrate. The atoms inside the metal string begin to push and beat the atoms of the air around them. So now, atoms are constantly pushing each other until they reach our ears. It's like a wave from a pebble thrown into a pond, and it happens very quickly at a speed of about 761 miles per hour. Then our eardrums begin to vibrate at the same frequency. And the little bones inside our ears transmit this vibration to the brain. The brain then does its magic, recognizes the pattern, and turns it into sounds. Great! Now we know that we need some particles to create sound. And we can find these particles in gases, liquids, and solid substances. And what about space? Nope, it's almost a perfect vacuum. And you've probably already heard that there's no sound in space because it's a vacuum. But what does it actually mean? Well, a vacuum is a perfect void. It's an area completely devoid of matter. It means there's nothing there. Yeah. Despite all those celestial bodies in space, there's actually no air in between them. No atoms, no particles, nothing. Not a zippo. Well, almost. To be honest, the perfect vacuum doesn't really exist. We can't get rid of atoms for good. But space is very close to this notion. On average, there are 15 to 80 atoms per one cubic inch. This may sound like a big number, but keep in mind that these atoms are tiny, and the void distance between them is huge. For comparison, one cubic inch of air contains about 16,000 atoms. So, of course, with such a low density, these atoms can't push each other. Even if the vibration is very strong, like, I don't know, a supernova, they still won't be able to do that. So, movies have been lying to us! All these epic space scenes actually take place in an awkward silence. Who would have guessed? But don't get upset. What if I tell you there are, in fact, some ways to hear sound in space? First of all, there's still sound on other planets. If there's an atmosphere on a space body, or at least something like gas, water, or a solid surface, there will be sound. In our case, the atmosphere becomes completely silent at about 60 miles above the Earth's surface. That's where the sky stops being blue and a black starry veil begins. In any case, we'd have to land on another planet, or at least get close to its atmosphere, to hear something. But whatever it is, it would sound very different. Let's take our favorite Venus as an example. The atmosphere there is very dense. Scientists jokingly call it a thick chemical soup. No thanks. So, if you somehow managed to stay alive and speak there, your voice would be very different. It would become much louder, and it would sound deeper. So, if you want a pleasant baritone, you know what to do. I wonder what would happen if Earth had a denser atmosphere. What would we hear then? Well, you can vaguely imagine that if you've ever been in the water. Water is very dense. Sound moves there much faster and better compared to the air, at a speed of almost a mile per second, depending on the water temperature. So if you sit in an empty room with no sound sources, you won't hear much, right? Now, dip your head in the water and check out how the same silence sounds here. It's not quiet at all. Even if you ignore the ever-present sounds of the water itself, you'll immediately notice how well you can hear your own body, how your blood pulsates in the veins, how your heart works, the slightest movement of your fingers. Kind of creepy, isn't it? This gives us an idea of what would happen to us on a planet with a denser atmosphere. And that's just crazy. We would hear everything. From scurrying animals to the movement of tectonic plates. Ah, come on, you'd probably say. It's obvious that there's sound on other planets. But didn't you say we can hear something in open space? Actually, yes. For example, in a cloud of dust. You can find space dust almost everywhere in space. It may be the remains of a star or something else. And in these places, everything is a bit denser than usual. This means there are probably dust clouds where particles are very close to each other, which means they can produce sounds. Of course, those will be very quiet, 
and transmit it over a very short distance. But it's better than nothing, right? Plus, we already have one real space sound recorded. It came from the Perseus galaxy, which is located 250 million light-years away from us. NASA recorded it in 2003. Those of us music geeks will want to know that it's a B-flat, 57 octaves below middle C on the piano. You'd have to add another 660 keys to the left on the keyboard. But its frequency is so low that the human ear unfortunately can't hear it. But besides that, we can only hear something inside spaceships. These are small pockets of air, after all. In a spacesuit, you would hear sounds very well, too, including your breathing or blood circulation in a spacesuit. But two astronauts flying side by side wouldn't hear each other, even if they got very close and shouted very loudly. It's quite funny. If you, being an astronaut, bumped into something, it would be very loud for you, but your friend wouldn't hear anything. That's why astronauts use radio devices. Now, purely theoretically, if you could somehow crawl out of your spacesuit and survive, you'd be able to hear the chatter and noises going on inside the spaceship. But how? So look, we have some air inside the spaceship, and it transmits sound. It reaches the metal casing and gets through it. And then, if you leaned against the ship, preferably touching it with your elbow or knee, the sound would be transmitted to the brain directly through your bones, ignoring the ears. Yes, our bones conduct sound. That's how, for example, deaf people listen to music. It's called bone conduction. It's used in some headphones and some other technologies. You can do a little experiment. Hold your fingers over your ears. Shut them properly so that you really don't hear much. Then try to touch a sound source. It can be anything vibrating. For example, a speaker playing music with some part of your body where the bone is close to the skin. Now, watch the miracle happen. You can hear the sound not through your ears, but directly in your brain. But please, don't repeat this experiment in open space. You know, ice cream? <laughs> now, you've probably heard about things like the sounds of space, where you can listen, for example, to the sounds made by the sun or different planets. How do we record these ones? Easily. There is another way to hear sound in space. Electromagnetic waves. In other words, a radio. Radio is the same form of electromagnetic radiation as light. These waves can travel in a vacuum without any problems. Astronauts' transmitters work that way. An astronaut says something to their friend. The sound waves turn into radio waves, reach the other person, and are then converted back into sounds. And this is how we get so-called space sounds. Our planet is actually very loud in that regard. We're sending a huge amount of radio waves into the universe, all radio signals we've ever listened to. It's a pity that they travel only 110 light years away from us. But you know, I think it's good that we don't hear everything that happens in space. Imagine if sound could easily travel through the universe? We would hear everything, from solar flares to nearby supernovas. Horrifying, right? So maybe we're just lucky. Hey, remember, in space, you can hear ice cream. Chocolate! Vanilla! Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter. Uranus and Neptune have ring systems too. And those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets. Astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. 
Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. May be a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. And there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object, which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets, and those rings probably combined and formed the Moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy objects store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons, Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, 
could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth, but it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the Sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. The constellation Orion is the brightest one in the sky. Orion is also in the night sky during the winter months when it's dark for the most hours. This makes Orion the most recognizable constellation to almost everyone in the world. Most stars don't seem to move too much or change their positions in the sky. This is not because stars are static. It's because our sun is moving along with them at about 483,000 miles per hour. It's a grand parade orbiting together around the Milky Way. The three stars that form the asterism, or star picture, of the belt of Orion have appeared in the same position for many thousands of years. There's a theory that the ancient Egyptians used the belt stars of Orion as a template for the placement of the three pyramids of Giza. The brightest star in Orion's belt is the middle one, called Al-Nilam. That's where the 481-foot-high Great Pyramid of Khufu was placed. To Khufu's west side, and in precise alignment with it, stands the 471-foot-tall pyramid Khafre. That's exactly where the star Alnitak is directly aligned to the bright middle star of the belt. To Khufu's east side, where the dimmest star of Orion's belt, Mintaka, is slightly offline with the other two stars, is the smallest pyramid of the three. Menkare is 213 feet high and slightly offline from the other two pyramids. This one example serves to illustrate the profound impact that the constellation Orion has had on human history. Orion's heroic-sized figure inspired the ancient Greeks to create a tapestry-like story. It involves six other constellations spread across the winter, spring, and summer sky. Let's see what this story tells us. Orion is pictured as a hunter. Back then, hunting was a big deal. Hunters supplied food. So there's a lot attached to this constellation. The whole food chain, in fact. In the sky, Orion is in combat with the constellation Taurus the Bull. Except, 
Taurus is not really a bull, it's an auroch. Aurochs are extinct now, but they were once plentiful in Europe. Standing six feet tall at the shoulder with long pointed horns, aurochs were powerful and fearsome creatures. There's a cave in the country of Spain that is filled with gorgeous paintings of aurochs. These pictures date back to 15,000 years ago, exquisitely drawn with inks that have not faded over the course of 150 centuries. The bulges in the rock stand out in three dimensions as the shoulder muscles of the aurochs. The constellation of Taurus, the auroch, is also in the cave, with the famous star clusters, the Pleiades, on its back, and the Hyades on its snout. The internet has a thrilling virtual tour of this Cave of the Bulls, full of aurochs. Maybe it should be renamed into the Cave of the Aurochs instead. Recently, the full DNA signature of an auroch was recovered from a well-preserved auroch skeleton. And scientists hope to breed these animals back into existence. Good luck and best wishes to this attempt to revive an extinct species. Aldebaran is the bright red giant star that marks the eye of Taurus. Bulls, when angry, always get this blood-in-the-eye look. Does it make you wonder why the bull's eye on a dartboard or archery target is always red? Hmm. Creeping up behind Orion is Leo the Lion. Lions don't just live in Africa in times long past. The Cave of the Bulls in Spain has a painting of Leo the Lion. Yep, these prehistoric people were drawing the constellations of the Zodiac. But that's another story for another time. Orion gets rid of both Taurus and Leo. And then the story gets interesting. Orion claims in his moment of triumph, I can defeat any animal I want. Orion's boast becomes the center of this sky drama when Gaia, or Earth, decides to get involved. Orion's words resounded throughout the world. This may be at the time in prehistory when civilization was changing from a nomadic hunter-gatherer tribal society to an agrarian society. The latter developed villages and towns 12,000 years ago. The human population was increasing and food supplies were diminishing. Something had to be done about Orion and all the hunters or social development would be stymied. Now enter Gaia into the story, but not into the sky. There is no constellation of Gaia in the sky. Gaia is Earth. Born parentless directly from the elemental chaos, Gaia was the feminine personification of our planet and the word itself means soil. Brightsiders may be interested in a modern scientific theory that also personifies Earth as a living organism. It's called the Gaia theory. It first appeared in the 1970s. The Gaia theory presents Earth as a biosphere, as if it were alive. The theory claims that all components of the planet work together as one totally interconnected dynamic system. This is called symbiosis, or synergy. Together, they produce the ideal conditions for life. Life adapts to regulate the atmosphere at 21% oxygen, the salinity of the oceans at a maximum of 24.7%, and planetary temperatures at 57 degrees Fahrenheit. To illustrate how life adapts to maintain control of the changes in planetary temperatures, the authors of the Gaia theory created the fictional planet Daisy World. Daisy World is completely covered by white and black daisies. When the sun becomes too hot, the black daisies start disappearing, while the white daisies increase in population. The whiteness of these flowers reflects sunlight, and the planet cools down. If the sun isn't hot enough, the white daisies reduce their population, and the number of the black daisies grows. The black flowers absorb sunlight, and the planet warms up. This is Gaia at work. It's basically the same principle that created oxygen and produced the ozone layer in the atmosphere. This layer helps to block the harmful ultraviolet light from the sun. Scientists have been slow to accept the Gaia theory because of the lack of convincing evidence. But these days, we have self-learning AI supercomputers. They can probably make it possible to integrate Earth's biological and geological systems. This way, we might get a clear picture of how the planet functions as a self-sustaining biosphere. Huh, wouldn't that be something? Now we can go back to the story of Orion and see how Gaia took care of the problem Orion's boast created for the planet. Obviously, Gaia couldn't send animals fiercer than a lion or an auroch to subdue Orion. So Gaia went small. She chose a poisonous scorpion to do the job, and it did the job. In the summer, the constellation of the scorpion crawls at almost the same latitude as Orion's foot. 
The scorpion may be a small animal in the same arachnid family as spiders and ticks, but in the sky, Scorpius is the 33rd largest constellation out of the 88 of them. There is a general rule that the larger a constellation is, the longer ago it was created by early star watchers. They had their pick of stars, first come, first served. And so, they made large constellations first and little constellations later. By the way, if you were the first in line at a buffet dinner, wouldn't you take big helpings and let the end of the line have the scraps? Think chocolate cake. Oh, sure, I'll only take a little piece. Nah, I don't think so. In this story of Orion, we have a collection of large conspicuous constellations like Leo, Taurus, Orion, and Scorpius, which confirms the great age of the story. Three smaller constellations, Lepus the Hare, Canis Major, and Canis Minor, Orion's two hunting dogs, complete the Orion star tapestry and add an interesting subplot. What we have then is a fable of two different worldviews or cosmologies, that of Gaia and that of Orion. One is feminine and the other is classically masculine. One is committed to dominating the natural world, that's the Orion archetype. The other is committed to the survival of the planet against all circumstances, that's Gaia. The two may seem opposed, but perhaps they're meant to be complementary. Look, Orion and the Scorpion are on the opposite sides of the sky, one in the winter, the other in the summer. They act like two poles, north and south, of the same magnet, our planet. This is what we see happening these days. Science and technology are becoming more and more sensitive to the natural environment. Myriads of satellites are monitoring the biosphere of Earth. Gaia and Orion are starting to work together toward what the ancient Greeks called Kalokagathia, or harmony. That's what we call synergy and symbiosis these days. Let's keep that synergy going strong.